ladies and gentlemen. My name is Linda Donacasti, and I, along with Larissa Olivier and Paul Camarillo, represent the people of the state of Georgia and the citizens of Glenn County. Why are we here? We are here because of assumptions and driveway decisions. A very wise person once said, don't assume the worst of another person's intentions until you actually know what's going on with them. Don't assume the worst with what they intend to do. But in this case, all three of these defendants did everything they did based on assumptions. Not on facts, not on evidence, on assumptions. And they made decisions in their driveways based on those assumptions that took a young man's life. And that is why we are here. So ladies and gentlemen, what's gonna happen now is the state is gonna give you its opening statement. I'm gonna do this in a couple different parts. The first part is I'm gonna talk about the indictment and the charges in the indictment. Then we're gonna talk about some housekeeping issues that relate to how evidence is going to come to you in this particular case. We're gonna talk about who the parties are, where this happened, and then exactly what led up to February 23rd of 2020 in the Satilla Shores neighborhood. So first off, the burden is on the state to prove to you these charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Now that is the doubt of a fair-minded and impartial juror honestly seeking the truth, not seeking doubt, and it's not beyond all doubt or to any mathematical certainty, but the burden is on the state. And the defendants have been indicted with the first count, which is murder. We call that malice murder. What's malice murder? That's intent to kill. Now, the state does not have to prove premeditation, planning. We're not required to prove motive about why anybody did anything. But malice is something that can be formed in an instant. And a fatal, mortal wound can be blown or can be shown. So in this case, the defendants have been indicted as parties to a crime for malice murder, intent to kill that was instantly formed. In addition, they've been charged with four counts of felony murder based on the four underlying felonies in the indictment. Now what's felony murder? Felony murder is where you're committing a felony. And someone dies because of the felony you're committing. Classic example, of course, is a guy goes into a drugstore to hold up the clerk, right? He's not there to murder the clerk, he's there to hold the clerk up. But during that armed robbery, it goes bad and he kills the clerk. Jay, That's I'm going to object. This is not an open statement. This is analogies and explanation of the law. You can state the law, I have no problem with that. But to go beyond that is not proper for open statement. The jury's been charged on what an opening statement is. Um, uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, I've just explained to you that this is the overview of the case uh, that will be presented by the state. The defense will have the same opportunity. Um, again, the law will be charged, or well, uh, that's a very legal term. The court's going to give you all of the law in this case, as I've already explained at the end. The state is now explaining its position with regard to the case. If we could make sure that it is uh, considered in that light. Mistake. Thank you, Judge. These are the charges in the indictment, which are felony murder. And it's committing a felony, not with intent to kill, but someone dies during that felony. So what felonies are we actually talking about here? Well, we're talking about aggravated assault with a shotgun. Because in this case, the state is going to show you and prove that Travis McMichael brought a shotgun. And then he pointed it at Mr. Arbery and then he pulled the trigger and he killed him during that aggravated assault. Aggravated assault with pickup trucks. Both Travis McMichael and Greg McMichael were in a white F-150 pickup truck that they used to cut off Mr. Arbery, to go at him, to get him to stop. Mr. Bryan used his Chevy Silverado to go at Mr. Bryan and to force him down into a ditch. 
as he ran on the public roadways of Satilla Shores. That's aggravated assault with a 5,000 pound lethal weapon otherwise known as a pickup truck. False imprisonment. That is where you detain somebody in violation of their personal liberty. You hold them. Or in the words of Greg McMichael, you trap them like a rat. And then we have criminal attempt at false imprisonment. And criminal attempt at false imprisonment in this case took place on Burford, within the Satilla Shores neighborhood, when both the McMichaels and Defendant Bryan attempted to confine Mr. Arbery on Burford. And that's criminal attempt. So a little housekeeping. Once again, our court reporter here is not going to be able to provide you with any transcripts. That's why taking the notes is so very important. I wanted to keep you informed that witnesses may be called out of order. The witnesses are going to come here and they're going to take the witness stand. We're going to try and put them up in order so you understand the sequencing. But you're also going to have some witnesses that they're going to give you some evidence and you're going to be thinking, well, how does this relate to something later? That's why you want to take notes because you'll be like three witnesses later, you're thinking, oh, I get it now. Okay? So it'll uh, you know, connect up. Witnesses are going to use reports. A lot of the witnesses are Glen County police officers, GBI people. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a memory contest. That's not what this is about, okay? So this isn't television. This isn't, aha, you can't remember. No, this is, these are professional people. They've done a bunch of cases since then. Like for instance, uh, the medical examiner. Yes, he performed the autopsy on February 24th, 2020. He's gonna come up here and he's gonna use his report. That's fine. He wants you to have the best information you possibly can because you're the finders of fact. So using reports is fine. Using transcripts is fine. In this particular case, um, some witnesses, I'm sure you can imagine, are going to be nervous. Remember jury selection? They're going to be nervous when they come in here and take the stand. And a lot of them do not want to be here. So a number of them gave statements. And if they take the stand and they can't recall, or they say something different than what they previously said, one of the attorneys, it could be any of the attorneys, may come up to them and go, well, could it help refresh your recollection? You looked at your transcript. Is that going to help you? But you said back in 2020. That's perfectly fine, too. In addition, as the judge said, we've got some videos that we can't play for you. We just can't. Rules of evidence. So, for instance, at the scene, the first responding officer, Officer Minshew, had a body cam on. And he talked to Defendant Bryan. But what Minshew will do is Minshew will come in here and he'll take the stand, and he's going to have the transcript of that body cam interview. And what he's going to do is he's going to tell you what Mr. Bryan said about what Mr. Bryan did. Okay? And because of the rules of evidence, we can't play the whole thing for you. But you will get those statements that are important. I just want you to be aware of that. When those officers come in, that's the reason they're going to use the transcript from the body cam, because sometimes those quotes are important. And the state wants those quotes, and the defense wants those quotes, and that's why they're being given to you. The state is also going to make every effort to put up relevant witnesses. We're not bringing in a whole bunch of people who don't know anything about anything. We're going to try and bring you only those relevant witnesses who have some relevant evidence to present. All right, ladies and gentlemen, enough with housekeeping. So who are we talking about in this case? Well, this is 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery. Now, this photo was taken you know, when he was much younger. But this is who he is. He lived over at 140 Boykin Ridge Drive, lived with his mother. He was also a brother. He was an uncle. And he was an avid runner. The evidence that he was an avid runner is you're going to be able to see his shoes, his Nike shoes, where he basically almost had absolutely no tread left on them whatsoever. So ladies and gentlemen, who else do we have? We have Travis McMichael, seated right over here, 34 years old at the time of this, worked at Metz and Marine, lived at 230 Satilla Drive with his parents, Greg McMichael and Lee McMichael. He is not and was not a law enforcement officer at the time of this incident. Greg McMichael 
64 years old at the time of the incident, a retiree living over at 230 Satilla Drive. At the time of this incident, not a law enforcement officer. And then we have defendant Brian, who goes by the name Roddy. So when people talk about him, you'll hear Roddy. 64 years old as well, a mechanic living at 307 Burford in the Satilla Shores neighborhood. At the time of this incident, not a law enforcement officer. So where are we talking about, ladies and gentlemen? Well, we're talking about exit 29 off of I-95 coming south, right? US-17 goes east toward Brunswick. It's the Satilla Shores subdivision, and we have these two addresses. So what are we really talking about? Here's an overview. So when we look at this overview, what we have here is we have our, oh, seriously. Now I have no idea what I've done to it. I made them say punch it. There we go. So we have the expressway up here. This is 17 coming down here. Royal Oaks. Here we've got Fancy Bluff, and this is Satilla Shores right there. In relationship to the scene where he was killed. So as you can see, he's off of here at 95 and 17 in the Fancy Bluff neighborhood off of Boykin Ridge Drive. <coughs> here is a house under construction. Here's the scene where it took place. It's really about 1.8 miles. It's under 2.5, but it's about 1.8 miles from his house to the scene of the house under construction. This is another overview of the neighborhood from a different direction. Once again, if you go this way, you're heading towards I-95. If you go this way, you're heading um, basically into Brunswick. Here's the Satilla Shores neighborhood. This is one of two ways to get into the neighborhood. The other way is way over here. There is no other exit out of the neighborhood at all just right here. So we talked about the defendants and where they reside. So first off, we have the blue circle. If you can see it, the blue circle is 230 Satilla Drive, where the McMichaels live. The red circle is where the homicide took place. And the other blue circle is where Mr. Brian's house is on Burford Drive. So you can kind of see, Satilla Drive kind of comes in, and then it goes into Burford Drive that way at that sort of weird V intersection. There's two-thirds Satilla Drive in relationship to the homicide location. There's 307 Burford in relationship to the homicide location. <coughs> So once again, there are our three main locations that we're going to be talking about. We are also going to be talking about 220 Satilla Drive. A lot of us will be using shorthand, 220. It is an open, unsecured construction site. The land is owned not by any of the defendants, no, by Larry and Amy English. It's under construction and it's wide open. There's no front door. There's no back door. There's no garage door. There's no garage door on the boat. Completely and utterly wide open. And it had been this way for over a year because Larry English was trying to act as a general contractor and finish the house himself. This open, unsecured construction site has absolutely no, no trespassing signs on it. None whatsoever. It also has no fence around the property at all. So where is it? It's at 220. There's 230. So ladies and gentlemen, what you have is you have 220, 222, 224, 226, 228, and then 230, which is the McMichaels house. In addition, one of the things I want to point out to you is 
you may have heard some of the names of the witnesses in this case. So right across this street, right here, is Jones Road. And you've got Ronnie Olson, Sue B. Lawrence, and El Bente, Matt El Bente's house. You can't really see him because of all the trees, but here's the open construction site. This is Jones Road, Ronnie Olson, Sue B. Lawrence, and right here, Matt El Bente. This is what it looks like. You can see it. No front door, no rear door, open garage doors. 220, it's until the drive. Now, Leary English will tell you because here's the thing. Leary English has health issues. So Leary English is not going to be here to testify. Leary English gave a deposition. All right? You will see that deposition because it was videotaped. And Leary English is going to tell you that he met the McMichaels only a few times. Like one, one or two times. However, Greg McMichael in his statement says that he doesn't even know Larry English. McMichaels had never been given permission to be at 220, nor had they ever received a warning not to be there. Larry English is going to tell you that there were lots of looky-loos. And Larry English had started to have concerns about liability. You know why? Because somebody told him that kids were starting to go out on his dock in the back. So we're talking about 2019, right? So Larry English is thinking, okay, I'm building this house under construction. I got this issue, okay, with these kids. So he starts to get cameras. Here's the thing. The other thing Larry English is going to tell you is nothing had ever been stolen from the construction site in 2019 or 2020. Larry English is going to tell you that nothing had ever been stolen from the construction site in 2019 or 2020. What he is going to tell you is that sometime during late October of 2019, sometime November of 2019, he is over at the construction site and he gets on a ladder and he looks down and he sees inside of his boat and he's like, oh, some stuff's missing. Oh my gosh, when did this happen? So some stuff has been stolen out of his boat, and it's expensive stuff. We're talking like $2,500 worth of stuff that's stolen out of his boat. His boat. He's, he's upset. But here's the problem. This boat had been back and forth to Douglas because Larry English lives two hours away from Satilla Shores. Larry English lives two hours away. So one of the reasons he went and got these cameras was he wanted to be able to see what was going on if the kids were on the dock. And these cameras would do motion activated. And they'd come up and they'd do a little 10 second, 30 second video of what the person was doing on his phone two hours away. So then, two hours away, you'd have to call 911 if someone was on that video. But here's the thing. He's gone back and forth to Douglas with this boat. So he doesn't call the police to report this because he doesn't know when his items were stolen. He doesn't know where his items were stolen. Were they stolen when it was in Douglas? Was it stolen when it was at 220 Satilla Drive? And he doesn't know who took it. And here's the thing. He goes through a list of suspects in his head. He's thinking it's his contractors. You know, the AMC guys were probably doing this. Then it's, oh, it's those looky loots. Some people have been on my property. Then he's thinking, wait a second. When I parked it in Douglas, there were these four teenagers going through this parking lot. So he's got all these different theories. He has no idea who actually did steal his stuff out of his boat. And he only discovered it in the early part of November of 2019. So October of 2019 comes, and he's got these concerns about liability, and he's concerned about, concerned about the kids on the dock, and he installs cameras in the dock area. He does. And what happens? He gets a looky loo On October 25th, 2019 at 10.04 in the evening, Mr. Arbery is seen on the dock video. You're going to get to see it. Okay? He's on the dock. He's wandering around. He does not take anything. Doesn't steal anything. He's wandering around on this dock looking around. And Larry English calls 911 to report it. The thing is, Mr. Arbery leaves by the time 911 shows up. He's gone. Because he only spends a few minutes looking around, wandering around, and then he leaves. Larry 
Just call 911. You'll be able to hear that 911 call. Then we have November 17th of 2019 at 10.21 p.m. We have a white couple that show up together, a man and a woman, and they're carrying a bag. So their English calls 911, and he's like, I think these are the people who stole my stuff. They're carrying a bag. I think they're there to go ahead and steal some more of my stuff. He wants the police to go. Of course, this white couple also leaves before the police arrive. But they are the people at this point in time that Larry English is suspecting, oh, they've stolen my stuff. Then what do we have? November 18th at 6.53, the very next night, Mr. Arbery is back. He's now on video inside the house. So what Larry English did is he had it out in the dock with the cameras. He's now installed inside the house some cameras. So up it comes. It's Mr. Arbery. Here's the funny thing about that 911 call. When Mr. English calls 911 on November 18th, he starts talking about the white couple. I called last night, and there was this white couple, and I think they're the ones who stole my stuff. That's what he says in the 911 call about Mr. Arbery. And then we have Larry English calling 911 on December 1st of 2019. He's calling because word on the street, or the rumor mill, or hearsay, however you want to say it, he gets information that the white couple is now living under the Fancy Bluff Bridge. Okay, so remember that big overview you saw 17? The Fancy Bluff Bridge is just right there as you head towards Brunswick. So he wants the police to go out there and check out whether that white couple is still living homeless underneath the Fancy Bluff Bridge because he's gotten some word on the street rumor to that effect. But he calls 911 to have the police go check it out. Then we have December 17th of 2019. By this point in time, Mr. English has gotten Officer Rash's personal cell phone number, or not personal cell phone number, but his cell phone number to call him. So on December 17th, his uh, camera phone thing goes off. Oh, somebody's over there. Okay. Mr. Arbery's at the open, unsecured construction site. He's there for a few minutes. And the actual time when he got there is unknown because... Mr. English didn't call 911. He called Officer Rash. And ladies and gentlemen, here's what Mr. English saw on his video for December 19th of 2019. Mr. Arbery wandering around inside. Doesn't take anything, doesn't steal anything, doesn't damage anything. Here's another camera angle, same night. Doesn't take anything, doesn't steal anything. And so Larry English calls Officer Rash. But here's the problem. Officer Rash isn't working that night. So Officer Rash is like, I'm off duty. I'm not in the neighborhood. I'm not in my patrol car to come and respond. So he basically says to him, listen, call 911. Call, call the police. And at that point, before Larry English can do that, this is what happens. mailboxes are, that's the street down Jones, and once again, these lights are Subi Lawrence's house. So you saw that Mr. Arbery ran off on his jog towards Subi Lawrence's house and then into the neighborhood. 
Okay, so into the neighborhood. In other words, down towards the McMichaels household. What happens next is this. On January 1st of 2020, bright, sunshiny, cold day, 10.30 a.m., 54 days prior to the homicide, Travis McMichael's handgun is stolen out of his unlocked pickup truck in front of 2.30 Satilla Drive. Greg McMichael went and moved it. He left it unlocked. And somebody came along. It's unsolved. And there's absolutely no evidence that Mr. Arbery is the one who went and stole Travis McMichael's handgun in broad daylight on January 1st of 2020. But this happened, and Travis McMichael called up. That brings us to February 11th of 2020. At 7.30 p.m., this is 12 days before the murder. So what happens on February 11th, 2020? Travis McMichael goes out in his car. He's coming back in to the neighborhood. And he sees Mr. Arbery at the location. Why does he recognize him? Because guess what Larry English has been doing in the meantime? Larry English has been talking to his neighbor, Diego Perez. Remember how we talked about 220, 222, 224. At 224, there's a man named Diego Perez. And his wife, Brooke Perez, and their kids. They all live there. And Larry English has been sharing these videos that you're going to see, that I just showed you, with Diego Perez. And Diego Perez has been going around sharing them with other neighbors. Because they're trying to identify who this guy is so somebody can tell him, please stop coming. Please stop showing up at night because we have to call the police and then the police show up and then nobody's there. So these videos have been shared and people have seen them. So Travis McMichael, who knows about this, not personally knows about it, this is all hearsay, word on the street, you know, he's seen these videos. Hasn't talked to Larry English personally, but he goes ahead and goes past the house. This is his neighbor's house, right? Okay, he's concerned. He sees somebody out in front of it. He actually stops and puts some headlights on him. Um, you can actually see the headlights in the video. And at that point, he goes ahead and goes home. So Travis McMichael goes home, gets his dad, Greg McMichael. They both get their guns, get back in the truck, and go back down the open, unsecured construction site. And that's when Travis McMichael calls 911. But here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. In this case, nobody has ESP, nobody can read minds, nobody can tell what's happening. Because in the meantime, when the uh, camera went off, guess what Larry English did? He didn't call the police. Larry English called Diego Perez. Okay? So what we've got is we've got Travis going down to his house. They're getting their stuff, getting their guns, coming back, calling 911. In the meantime, Diego Perez is coming out, okay, because he's been called by Larry English. And then the police show up. So you got all these people out in this neighborhood. And, and don't get me wrong, property crimes, people are concerned. Nobody likes to live in a neighborhood where there are property crimes, right? People are very concerned about property crimes. But this is basically... What happens is Officer Rash shows up with two other officers. You got all the neighbors out there, and everybody's looking around. Well, here's the thing. What does Mr. Arbery do? He shows up, he wanders around for a few minutes, and he leaves. So by the time Travis has gone down and gotten his dad, by the time Diego Perez has been called, Mr. Arbery has left. He's not there. But this is what's really important, ladies and gentlemen. Officer Rash has a conversation with Greg and Travis McMichael that evening about this person who's unknown to them who is wandering around inside the open, unsecured construction site. And this is on body cam video. And this is what is said. She's got a dog in her pocket around this black crap nigger. Hey, uh... Matter of fact, 
it up, it appears that my the computer is trying to catch up with itself. I'm going to try this again. Yeah, inside, wandered around for a few minutes. 